It was the start of Franklin Roosevelt's third term as president. He seemed to be at the peak of his power and popularity. In 1940, he had overcome opponents in his own Democratic Party and beaten the Republicans' best candidate, Wendell Wilkie. He had broken the tradition against serving more than two terms. Since the war in Europe began, he had gotten most major foreign policy laws through Congress that he wanted. His approval rating in polls was around 70%, up from the 50s and 60s in previous years. A Republican senator wrote in his diary that FDR was the face power politician of the world. Roosevelt did seem to have reached new heights of political skill and personal energy, despite being older and more worn. His doctor said his health was the best in years, he was still swimming and had lost weight. We are looking ahead to the next few years without any apprehension, the doctor said. Beyond his personal power, FDR now led a new ruling coalition of three of the four major parties in American politics. His own Democratic Party included industrial laborers, relief recipients, Western farmers, city machines, middle and upper income groups that had left the Republicans. The Democrats were allied with the Southern Conservatives who ran the Solid South in Congress through seniority and committees. Though they fought over domestic issues, these two Democratic factions agreed on foreign policy. After years out of power, the Republican Party was split. The Midwestern congressional leaders like Taft, Vandenberg and Martin were cautious about change and isolationist. The presidential Republicans like Wilkie were more liberal and internationalist, based in northeastern cities and states. Unable to overcome FDR's third-term bid, this Republican division continued. Roosevelt exploited these Republican divisions. In June 1940, he made Henry Stimson his Secretary of War, a liberal Republican who supported aid to the Allies. This brought many internationalist Republicans alienated since Hoover's time into the administration. They were lawyers and bankers from the Northeast who went to Ivy League schools and worked in big enterprises. Joined by Knox, Landon and others, they gave FDR's coalition bipartisan credentials. Southerners like Hull and Jesse Jones also gave him regional balance. Hull was still the moralistic trade advocate, a bridge to Southern congressmen. Jones was a populist Texan businessman close to Wall Street who ran commerce and the Federal Loan Agency. The rest of the cabinet, Margenfor, Perkins, Ikes, Jackson, Wickard, Walker, covered major democratic groups, finance, labor, conservation, cities, agriculture. With experience and diversity, it was one of the most able cabinets ever. On Capitol Hill, FDR had support from party leaders like Rayburn, McCormack, Barclay and Burns. Though Southern committee chairs often opposed the New Deal, they backed him on foreign affairs. As national priorities shifted outward, even critics like Senator Walter George now supported intervention abroad. And Northern urban Democrats like Wagner, Walsh, Bloom, Norton and Sabath chaired committees too. So in early 1941, Roosevelt commanded a formidable three-party coalition. But he relied on popular backing. He took soundings through visitors, polls, mail, politicians and the press. Opinions strongly favoured more aid to Britain. By two to one people supported Lend-Lease and specific steps like repairing British ships in US ports. The president had to balance public sentiment for action with isolationist opposition in Congress and elsewhere. His usual skill and vigor would be fully tested in charting the right course ahead. In this time, Roosevelt facing a mighty dilemma, how to provide decisive aid to Britain and other European democracies against Nazi Germany, without angering the strong isolationist mood in America. The solution? President lend not as a step toward war, but away from it. Of course, Roosevelt's opponents like Senator Burton Wheeler saw right through this. He accused the president of duplicity and said lend would blow under every fourth American boy. Roosevelt fiercely counterattacked, calling Wheeler's words rotten and unpatriotic. So the stage was set for a titanic legislative battle when Congress took up the lend bill. This bill gave the president huge power to lend or lease military equipment to any nation whose defense he deemed vital. The Chicago Tribune cried dictatorship, but polls showed public support, especially on the East Coast. In testimony, Roosevelt's cabinet warned urgently of invasion threats. 
While sidestepping hard questions about costs or convoying supplies across the U-boat infested Atlantic. Then came the opposition star witness, the dashing, heroic aviator Charles Lineberg. He electrified the room by warning that America had no stake in European victory and should avoid the war. Instead, he said we should focus on our own hemisphere. Roosevelt watched the news as Lineberg saw in metric complicated efforts on the hill. Despite the needling questions and lengthy speeches on Capitol Hill, Roosevelt secured enough votes for House passage. But the isolationist high priests awaited in the Senate. This included sages like Hiram Johnson of California and Robert La Follette of Wisconsin, along with skilled tacticians like Arthur Vandenberg and Gerald Nye. They made Roosevelt work for every vote. In a dramatic turn, Roosevelt's recent rival Wendell Wilkie returned from Britain to offer vital endorsement, winning cheers and jeers. He is my president now, Wilkie proclaimed, stealing the isolationist thunder. Ultimately, bipartisan Senate amendments gave Congress more control over appropriating Lend-Lease funds before passage. After a final isolationist filibuster, the bill passed decisively in March 1941. Roosevelt immediately asked for $7 billion to implement it. So there you have it, Roosevelt prevailed against the isolationists to push through Lend-Lease. But the debate left America deeply divided. Roosevelt finally signed the Lend-Lease bill to help the Allies, but he was still upset about all the accusations hurled at him. After dinner one night, he vented for an hour, attacking his critics. Sherwood was shocked at the bitterness. But Hopkins said not to worry, FDR just needed to blow off steam. Sure enough, in his speech the next day, Roosevelt took the high road, rallying the nation to speed up weapons production. But could his administration accelerate production fast enough? Many doubted it. FDR had resisted calls for a supply chart to run everything. He insisted that under the Constitution, only the President could be in charge. But he couldn't coordinate production day to day. His new Office of Production Management had unclear leadership between manufacturer Knudsen and labor leader Hillman. When reporters asked who was in charge, FDR dodged the question. Shortages of materials like aluminum soon surfaced. FDR remained upbeat about capacity, but his team kept hitting troubles. Bernard Baruch and others urged a single mobilization boss, but FDR refused. He had his reasons, flexibility, keeping options open, preventing any one man from gaining too much power. Still, his decentralized approach caused confusion. The country's social problems also persisted despite the New Deal. When FDR took office, he decried a third of the nation living in poverty. Now, at his third inauguration, little had improved. Malnutrition was still widespread, housing was dreadful in crowded defense areas, and 40% of draft recruits were unfit from poor nutrition. The army was still segregated, with almost no black officers. FDR's agencies were trying, but they were underfunded and dependent on local authorities. Labour leader Sidney Hillman faced these problems daily, struggling to shift workers to defence jobs. FDR liked Hillman, he was pragmatic but principled, fighting for unions but able to compromise. Now Hillman had to balance industry owners, communists, ethnic groups and his own fiery subordinate Lewis. Labour unrest surged as Lewis and other militants pressed demands. Hillman needed to unite Labour behind the defence effort. FDR himself wrestled with balancing aid abroad and needs at home. Isolationists warned that he would strip America to help the Allies. Privately, he agreed domestic needs came first. He wrote Churchill that if war came, Britain must not bleed America dry. Publicly, he insisted America could supply both. This rosy view spurred isolationists' fears that FDR cared more about foreigners than his own people. The president tried to educate people that aid abroad strengthened security at home. But the old divisions persisted. As FDR struggled to rally the country, he faced a divided people. Americans fell along a spectrum from isolationists wanting no involvement abroad to interventionists urging full-scale war. Most were in between, favoring aid to Britain, but wary of conflict. FDR had to move this ambivalent middle his way. The president walked a tightrope between bold action abroad and maintaining national unity at home.
He had to keep up morale among interventionists without provoking the isolationists in Congress into cutting off lend lease. He sent Hopkins to stiffen Churchill's backbone at a low moment, authorized US Navy escorts for convoys, and stood firm against Hitler's provocations. Yet FDR also made concessions to avoid inflaming isolationist sentiment. He accepted neutering amendments to lend lease, turned the other cheek to vicious personal attacks, and used his influence in Congress sparingly until the final vote. Churchill grew impatient with Roosevelt's cautious pace, demanding the US enter the war. FDR insisted the people were not ready. In truth, neither was the military. Shortages of planes, tanks, guns, and ships were still dire. Mobilization was sputtering under divided leadership. The president could not lead where the people refused to follow. At home, FDR and his team knew their welfare programs were inadequate. They tried piecemeal efforts to tackle specific problems. Eleanor Roosevelt urged more funds and reform. Haroldites fought for decent housing. Hillman struggled for fair labor practices. But systemic solutions were blocked by poverty, prejudice, and politics. So as FDR looked abroad at the raging war and suffering people, and at home at his divided, unready nation, he trod delicately. One April morning, John Gunther, a famous journalist, visited President Roosevelt at the White House to share his impressions from a recent tour of Latin America. After a long wait, Gunther finally met with Roosevelt, who greeted him brightly. Gunther mentioned visiting all 20 Latin American countries. When Roosevelt asked about any bad spots, Gunther named Panama, whose president he called an adventurer and Harvard man. My goodness, Roosevelt exclaimed. Not really a Harvard man? Roosevelt then began a long, chatty monologue about Latin America. He talked about meeting the Haitian president, how Argentina was a problem that might need colonizing, how lend lease would help through money, and how tourist business could grow in Chile. He even recommended a man to meet in Puerto Rico who liked very dry martinis. Roosevelt admitted idealistic speeches mattered less than power in Latin America. Suddenly, Roosevelt took a call from Harry Hopkins and began discussing American foreign policy history. Realizing it was actually Secretary of War Stimson, Gunther saw Roosevelt's quick hurt expression as Stimson cut him off. Roosevelt abruptly ended the meeting, leaving Gunther awed but concerned by his indiscretions. Such experiences were common in Roosevelt's White House. Visitors lined up to meet the president, who welcomed them in his Oval Office with smiles and first names, even for Englishmen. His simplicity and grace charmed guests, though some felt their issues were ignored amid Roosevelt's animated stories and impressive command of facts. The second floor residence reflected Roosevelt's personality. His Oval Study, the decision-making hub of the free world, was modestly furnished with a clutter of knick-knacks and family photographs. Eleanor Roosevelt's sitting room was nearby, showing her continued role as conscience and activist. Across the hall was Harry Hopkins' suite, demonstrating his new prominent running lend lease, though his tactless intensity still annoyed some. The Roosevelt's marriage had evolved into one of devotion and tolerance rather than romance. Eleanor stayed busy as wife, mother, hostess, columnist, lecturer, party organizer, and advocate. Her figure still impressed many, Franklin had learned to protect himself from her constant importuning. Hopkins remained driven and irreverent with an almost supernatural sense of Roosevelt's needs. He could directly confront tangled problems and act decisively. Churchill called him the Lord Root of the matter. By living at the White House, Hopkins incurred jealousy, but Roosevelt valued his selfless dedication. When Wendell Wilkie asked why Hopkins stayed so close, Roosevelt insisted every president needed someone who wanted nothing but to serve. So Roosevelt's White House blended home, mansion, and executive office. The mansion hosted tours and receptions, now minimized due to the war. The Oval Office bustled with visitors vying for Roosevelt's time. In the residence, Hopkins enjoyed unprecedented access while Eleanor persisted as conscience. And Roosevelt reigned at the center, wheeling through hallways, telling stories, radiating information and charm, embracing the crises of a world at war. In December 1940, Adolf Hitler demanded of workers, who was I before the Great War? He answered, an unknown, nameless individual, 
By spring 1941, Hitler had become a messiah to his people, a miracle worker who fulfilled his promises. To Churchill, he was a monstrous abortion of hatred and defeat, not far from his private view. To Russians, despite their pact with Germany, Hitler embodied capitalism and militarism's final convulsions. To many Americans and Britons, he was a madman with frenzies who foamed at the mouth. To Roosevelt, Hitler was an enigma with odd resemblances. Both liked to talk, dwell on old times, act out roles, and be flattered. But similarities were superficial, coming from different worlds with opposite values. Roosevelt loved his upbringing, Hitler hated and feared his father but loved his mother. Roosevelt adapted throughout life, Hitler showed little ability to change. Ideologically, they were opposites. Hitler considered Roosevelt simply crazy, behaving like a tortuous Jew due to alleged Jewish ancestry. In early 1941, Hitler faced his life's transcendent decision, ordering a massive May attack on Russia, Operation Barbarossa. His directive stated the German military must crush Russia before finishing Britain. But it was not a final decision. As generals planned, Hitler weighed strategic realities. Britain was not yet finished with increasing American support. Russia seemed a cunning, demanding ally, wanting control over Finland, Bulgaria, Turkey, and more after Hitler invited them into his tripartite pact. Soon Hitler called Stalin a cold blackmailer. Russia also appeared weak, with purged officers and poor defenses, and Ukraine eager for freedom. Hitler knew Germany must avoid a two-front war. But Russia's vulnerability seemed to warrant betrayal. Its vast borders were poorly guarded. Its people wanted liberation. Hitler imagined global possibilities from engaging Russia, tying down Britain and prompting Japan to attack America, diverting its main force to the Pacific. He ordered aid for Tokyo. Conquering Russia would remove any German threat from the rear, ensure raw material access, and topple the anti-Nazi coalition. Timing was ripe too since all nations lagged in rearming. Indecision risked the opposition alliance acting first against him. Were not London and Moscow already plotting? Some Light Admiral Raider wanted Mediterranean operations, not Eastern. But Hitler saw complexity versus Russia's simplicity. Multiple fronts demanded consummate diplomatic, propaganda and military skill. Better to crush Russia fast and turn back to Britain. Ideology also drove Hitler. He had long feared and loathed Slavs and Jewish Bolshevism. Though expedient, his pact with Stalin clashed with his sacred mission to defeat communism. So Hitler weighed global war, assured in his decision-making power. Between meals he could desolate cities, destroy millions of lives. His circle vied to carry out orders. Opposition was suppressed. Allies like Mussolini were subordinate. Only resistant generals had status to challenge Hitler, but they were impotent after being repeatedly proved wrong and bullied. Without moral fervor of an independent nation, Hitler met little resistance in early 1941. Methodically, he eliminated Balkan independence or British threat to his Russian invasion's flank. One by one, nations acquiesced, like Bulgaria, or were neutralized, like Turkey. Only Yugoslavia retained freedom of action and will. For a time, Hitler sought its genteel submission. But even meeting Prince Paul's agreement to the tripartite pact was insufficient. Then came Hitler's fatal schedule change, served military officers with Western ties staged a coup in Belgrade. Furious, Hitler unleashed the Wehrmacht on Yugoslavia without declaration of war. Belgrade was mercilessly bombed into submission in days. The attack on Yugoslavia forced Hitler to delay invading Russia by several weeks. Some generals hoped he would reconsider Barbarossa entirely since it now lost surprise and time. But Hitler was adamant political considerations made the Russian campaign this year vital. Privately, he fumed over the Balkan sideshow imposed on him. Impatiently, he turned attention back east. In April, Hitler hosted a military briefing in Berlin. For hours, generals reviewed Russian invasion plans Hitler knew by heart. He cared little for details, instead ranting against Bolshevism and his life's purpose of securing Lebensraum in the East. Russia's demise would solve all economic problems, he proclaimed. When generals warned occupying Russia would require one million men, 
Hitler scoffed, saying winter would finish them. After generals left, Hitler relaxed among intimates. But his loathing of Russia boiled over. Pounding the table, he vowed destruction for its leaders. To Hitler, this was no war but an ideological crusade. Excitedly, he imagined the frontier secured and German colonists remaking the East. Then he would deal with America and resume his contest with Britain for mastery of Europe. His global strategy interlocked, each front supported the other. Conquering Russia would simply remove a threat at his back. So in spring 1941, possessed by world historical ambition, Hitler stood at destiny's crossroad. Britain still resisted, but he had already crushed much of Europe. Now his strategic genius would deal Bolshevism a death blow, eliminating Germany's final vulnerability. What remained was seizing the moment against a coalition not yet fully arrayed. Hitler's decision for Barbarossa followed ideology and global strategy. But ultimately, for better or worse, his will alone set events inexorably in motion. Winter 1940 brought deep reflection for the British leaders. Though they had beaten back the Luftwaffe and the threat of invasion, shipping losses threatened their supply lines. Most troubling was the strategic situation in the Mediterranean. British forces were spread thin trying to prop up Near East Allies against the Nazi threat. In early 1941, Roosevelt sent Hopkins to England as his envoy. Despite his unkempt appearance, Hopkins impressed the British with his utter commitment to defeating Hitler. The President also sent Harriman to facilitate lend and Donovan to boost Balkan resistance. Sending his own envoy, Churchill appointed Halifax as ambassador to strengthen ties with America. By March, Britain faced a dire predicament as the Germans threatened Greece. Eager to support the valiant Greeks and build a Balkan bulwark, London debated stripping forces from North Africa. Some generals opposed this dispersal, fearing it would weaken the vital Libyan front where Rommel was gathering strength. Though supremely influential, Churchill had to convince both his cabinet and skeptical military men. Swayed by sympathy for Greek courage and dreams of a continental foothold, Churchill committed Britain to defend Greece despite the hazards. When Hitler's Blitzkrieg smashed into Greece and Yugoslavia in April, British and Greek units retreated in disarray, abandoning 12,000 comrades. Meanwhile in Libya, Rommel exploited British withdrawals and besieged Tobruk, undoing earlier victories. The Luftwaffe then executed history's first major airborne attack, seizing Crete after bitter fighting. Stung by these defeats, Churchill faced criticism in Parliament, even from his old chief Lloyd George. Churchill defiantly responded that he would not surround himself with no men who failed to grasp Britain's desperate hour. Still, doubts grew after the Crete disaster. Even the sympathetic Roosevelt implied further withdrawals might ultimately benefit British strategy. Churchill bristled, insisting that in this war every post must be held to the last. Though Parliament was mollified, Churchill burned to regain the initiative. Bolstered by America's growing involvement, he hoped the two nations could soon turn the tide against Hitler's dark tyranny. The year was 1940. War was raging in Europe and Asia. In the East, Japan had occupied parts of China and was looking to expand its empire. But where would they strike next? The Japanese leaders in Tokyo had big dreams, but no clear strategy. In Washington, President Roosevelt watched Japan's moves warily. He began restricting exports to them, trying to curb their military ambitions. But he found the Japanese hard to predict. In early 1941, Japan's Foreign Minister Matsuoka visited Germany and Russia, cementing ties with his Axis partners. In Berlin, Hitler boasted to Matsuoka of crushing Europe in mere months. He urged Japan to strike British colonies in Asia, saying now was the perfect time, with Russia neutralized and America not yet rearmed. Matsuoka was cagey and non-committal, constrained by voices of caution back home. Still, the seed was planted. From Russia, Matsuoka secured a neutrality pact, believing this protected Japan's northern flank. With the Axis unified and Russia neutralized, Tokyo felt it could now focus on conquering China once and for all. In Qingting, China's capital, the people suffered badly under Japanese bombardment. At his simple home, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek led China's struggle. His nation verged on collapse after years of resistance, 
they desperately needed American aid. By early 1941, despite Chiang's impassioned pleas, America had sent poultry arms to China. But Chiang gained a sympathetic ear in President Roosevelt. Though obstructed by his own war department, Roosevelt helped arrange the Flying Tigers Air Squadron for China and promised aid under Lend-Lease. When the Russia-Japan Pact was announced, Chiang feared abandonment. But both Russia and America reaffirmed their support. Roosevelt took quiet steps to provide China monetary aid and military supplies. As 1941 progressed, Japan and China balanced uneasily between conflict and diplomacy. Chiang lectured the Americans that China's victory could be won on the ground. The Japanese sought advantage through both war and politics. And Roosevelt walked a tightrope, slowly applying pressure to restrain Japanese aggression. The stage was set for a pivotal year in the Pacific. Japan stood poised to expand its empire. Emboldened by Nazi victories and the Russian pact, its leaders now focused intensely on the final prize, the total conquest of China. In China, Chiang's nation was exhausted from years of courageous but lopsided combat. His people longed for relief. Chiang implored Britain and America for substantial help, warning them that China's collapse could open the door for Japan to dominate the Pacific. And in Washington, Roosevelt cautiously calibrated his responses, trying to deter Japanese aggression without provoking outright war. The coming months would test the metal and strategic grasp of leaders on all sides of this gathering storm. It was early 1941, and President Franklin Roosevelt was still avoiding major strategic decisions even as global tensions escalated. Foreigners thought he had a secret master plan, but in truth, FDR shied away from commitments. He told the military to avoid long-term plans, saying we may all be dead by then. With FDR offering no firm leadership, military chiefs like Army General George Marshall pressed for their own Atlantic First strategy, strengthening ties with Britain against Hitler. When British officials secretly visited, joint staffs agreed Germany was the main foe, despite Japan's threats. Still, FDR would not approve explicit war plans, only modest arms for Britain. His policy was all aid short of war, but without forcing conflict. Hitler alone could trigger FDR's strategy by attacking US ships, which FDR resisted provoking. In April 1941, Hitler rampaged through Yugoslavia and Greece. Britain again seemed on the brink as FDR helped ferry weapons and pilots across the Atlantic. Publicly FDR joked about Lend-Lease garden hoses, but privately feared Britain might fall. The North Atlantic lifeline itself was under dire threat as German ships and U-boats swarmed. Churchill desperately pleaded for naval escorts to fend off wolf packs attacking convoys. FDR had long demurred, knowing escorts could mean shooting at Germans, pulling America into the war. Yet the crisis peaked in May 1941 as more ships were sunk. FDR's advisers urged action while polls showed public opinion shifting toward escorting convoys. FDR remained torn, understanding the stakes and risks. If he did nothing, Britain might starve or surrender, but escorting convoys could still drag America into the widening war. At a White House meeting, FDR surprised advisers by abruptly agreeing to expand the neutrality zone for Navy patrols. But he still agonized over direct convoy escorts, fearing public outrage over a stealthy, incremental war. In a fateful decision, FDR opted to publicly announce his escort order, gambling people would back defending freedom of the seas. The next days were anxious as FDR awaited reaction. Some in Congress protested, but most opinion backed FDR, believing escorting was still short of actual war. By his risky showdown, FDR won public support to help Britain survive, edging toward wider conflict with Hitler. Step by step, America was being entangled, however reluctantly, in the World War. Roosevelt was an opportunist avoiding rigid commitments, while Stalin was a calculating ideologue viewing events through a Marxist lens. Both were constrained by isolationist sentiment at home. Hitler held a strategic initiative, forcing Roosevelt and Stalin into reactive positions. Stalin tried to balance ideology and realpolitik. He sought collective security with Western nations against Hitler, but mutual suspicion on all sides made cooperation impossible. 
After failed negotiations, Stalin pivoted to sign a non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1939, stunning the world. But Stalin still hoped the Axis and Allies would exhaust themselves, avoiding a two-front war for the Soviet Union. The fall of France and Nazi gains rattled him. With the Axis ascendant, an isolated Russia faced peril. But anti-communism in Britain and isolationism in America hindered a unified front against Hitler. In late 1940 and early 1941, Stalin received growing warnings of a German invasion but processed them narrowly. Wishfully thinking Hitler would still turn west against Britain, Stalin tried to protect Berlin while his armies remained unprepared. In a surprise visit, Stalin embraced the visiting Japanese foreign minister, securing a neutrality pact in the east. But events moved beyond Stalin's control. On June 22, 1941, Operation Barbarossa was unleashed as German forces flooded into Russia with deception, surprise and stunning force. As Stalin reeled in shock, Churchill declared over the Radio Britain solidarity despite long opposition to communism. In Tokyo, officials were dismayed but saw new advantage against weakened Russia. After two weeks, Stalin rallied his people in a radio address, invoking patriotic resistance against the Nazi threat. The attack catalyzed the grand alliance between capitalist West and communist East that would ultimately defeat Hitler. But it arose from necessity, not shared principles. Mistrust lingered even amid common cause against fascism. Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill overcame their vast differences to forge an unlikely partnership that would change history. When Hitler invaded Russia in June, Churchill rushed to declare Britain support. But behind the steely rhetoric, suspicion lingered between London and Moscow. Communication had been frosty. Some in the Kremlin wondered if Churchill had provoked Hitler's attack. And could the Red Army even hold out? In Washington, too, officials eyed Moscow warily. But Roosevelt felt Hitler the bigger threat. Though vague on specifics, he spoke of aiding Russia. His administration unfroze Soviet funds while allowing aid to flow through Vladivostok. Still America focused on helping Britain first. For Roosevelt, the Nazi invasion pushed London and Washington closer. Pressure mounted to escalate naval operations in the Atlantic, not to aid Russia. Hitler would beat Russia quick, men told Roosevelt. The time to strike in the Atlantic was now. When Roosevelt authorized the Navy to escort US shipping, including foreign ships joining convoys, he took a big step. But he balked at openly protecting British shipping, wary of Congress and Japan. He wanted events to drag America into the Atlantic War. His boldest July act was occupying Iceland, helping Britain control the North Atlantic. Roosevelt downplayed the move, but privately knew its risk. His ships now guarded a British base against attack, practically an act of war, said Admiral Stark. So in July 1941, Roosevelt crossed into undeclared war, nudging events to produce an Atlantic crisis. But he moved tactically, at the mercy of Hitler's strategy. And Hitler, eyeing Russia, still refused his admirals pleas to provoke America, for now. In Asia, too, Roosevelt trod with care. He would risk war in the Atlantic, but avoid provoking Japan while engaged with Hitler. It was no simple matter, the two fronts were linked in countless ways. The pieces were cantilevered in complex balance. One blow could set the fragile mobile in motion. Roosevelt saw all this, but dealt with problems piecemeal, not seeking some grand strategy. He wanted no showdown with Japan while finally taking on Hitler in the Atlantic. Churchill simply aimed to beat Germany. And Japan, torn over expansion north or south, focused on China. So the great powers swayed, their secondary pressures building, that summer of 41. Where the mobile might tip and turn, no leader could foresee. But Roosevelt was prodding events along, come what may. The year was 1941. Hitler's armies marched across Russian soil, seeking to crush the communist threat. In London, Churchill rushed to declare Britain's support for Russia, desperate to keep Hitler distracted on the Eastern Front. But behind the rhetoric, suspicion lingered. Communication between the Western powers and Stalin had been frosty. Some in the Kremlin even wondered if Churchill had goaded Hitler into attacking, to weaken Russia. And could the Red Army withstand the Nazi onslaught?
Across the ocean, American officials watched anxiously, torn between distaste for godless communism and fear of fascism. The isolationists rejoiced, declaring this was not America's fight. Others urged pragmatism, better than Reds than the Nazis. Roosevelt trod carefully, wary of inflaming public opinion. Though polls showed most Americans favored a Russian victory, aid would be limited. Atlantic first still ruled the day. While politicians maneuvered, the events on the ground darkened. The Red Army reeled back, cause shattered, communications failed. Mills of men poured into the wall of war, swallowed up. Yet glimmers of hope persisted, peasants still fighting from trenches, Nazi tanks bogged in mud. The Wehrmacht's confidence wavering. The North Atlantic saw a different face of war, orderly convoys shepherded through the seas by darting escorts. Carefully planned, though not without risk. In the long nights, skirmishes sometimes erupted between the shepherds and the prowling U-boat wharves. As Russia burned, military experts wrote off the Red Army. Fid grew Stalin might quit or, worse still, reunite with Hitler. Churchill, though no friend of communism, knew the devil he must suck with. But America remained reluctant. Roosevelt bided his time, awaiting word from his envoy in Moscow, Harry Hopkins. Thrown in secretly, Hopkins met Stalin, bearing Roosevelt's promise of aid. Stalin, machine-like in focus, detailed his needs, planes, guns, gas, and vowed Russia would fight on for years. Bolstered by Hopkins, Roosevelt pushed the speed supplies to Russia, hindered by bureaucracy and his own Atlantic First strategy. The president yearned to aid the embattled Soviets, both for humanity's sake and self-interest. But he dared not alienate anti-communist feeling at home. Still Moscow fought on, changing power balances across the globe. But America clung to old strategies, not yet seeing the shape of things to come. The wheels of history turn. New allies emerge, new dangers loom. In time, strategies shift to face the changing tide. But on that uncertain day in 1941, uneasy partners bound themselves together, knowing the alternative if fascism prevailed was too dire to conceive. The president had ordered that war supply and the economy speed up in March, but progress was unsatisfactory. War demand was increasing rapidly, but supply was only increasing slowly. The president tried to put a positive spin on things at press conferences, but conceded that progress was much too slow. He set up new agencies to help with the effort like the Office of Price Administration to deal with rising prices, and the Office of Civilian Defense under Fiorella LaGuardia. But these agencies had little real authority and struggled to get things done. There was conflict and turmoil at every step. Military officials wanted more resources while civilians tried to protect the needs of farmers and manufacturers. Different agencies and divisions competed with each other. There were also labor disputes, including a wildcat strike at an aircraft plant that Roosevelt had to order the army to take over. New dealers charged that big business was deliberately holding back production to protect profits. Businessmen argued that labor was unwilling to make sacrifices. Cars were still being produced despite metal shortages. By late spring, the mobilization effort seemed to be faltering. There were shortages of weapons and ammunition. Training was behind schedule. A Senate committee led by Harry Truman began investigating the defense program and found delays, low goals, and failure to mobilize the nation. The public demanded stronger leadership from the president. When the draft law expired, Roosevelt had a hard time getting Congress to extend it. The bill only passed the House by one vote. The president had to balance government as usual with the defense effort. He set up a committee on fair employment practices after A. Philip Randolph threatened a march on Washington to protest discrimination. But the committee had little real power. In summary, in the first half of 1941 the defense mobilization effort was plagued by conflicts, delays, and failures despite the president's efforts to speed things up. Stronger and more decisive leadership was called for, but the president had to navigate a divided government and public opinion. The establishment of new agencies and the executive order on fair employment were steps in the right direction, but real progress was still lacking. It was the summer of 1941. War was raging in Europe and Asia, 
but President Franklin Roosevelt managed to slip away from Washington for a secret rendezvous at sea. He boarded his presidential yacht, the Potomac, under the cover of darkness and sailed north along the Atlantic coastline. After a few days cruising, the Potomac pulled into a secluded harbor where Roosevelt transferred to a naval warship, the Augusta. Even his own son Elliot, summoned aboard, had no idea what was going on. The Augusta steamed steadily northeast across the open ocean. Roosevelt was not alone. With him were his most trusted military advisors and confidants, including Harry Hopkins. They were headed to a remote bay on the coast of Newfoundland called Argentia, where they would await the arrival of Winston Churchill on the British battleship Prince of Wales. This clandestine meeting between the two great Allied leaders had been months in the making. Both were masters of drama and symbolism. Now finally they had arranged the stage for their first summit in the midst of war. When Churchill came aboard the Augusta, grinning ear to ear, Roosevelt greeted him like an old friend. At last, we've gotten together. Hopkins later joined them as they retired to discuss the pressing issues at hand, the shipping lifelines across the Atlantic, the precarious situation in the Pacific, the aid desperately needed by Russia. That evening, Churchill regaled the Americans with one of his vivid oratories about the course of the war. Roosevelt listened intently, deep in thought, occasionally asking a question or two. The next day, Sunday, Roosevelt visited Churchill on the Prince of Wales. An open-air church service was held on the battleship's massive gun deck with British and American sailors assembled together. It was a powerful display of Anglo-American unity. Churchill was visibly moved as the old and onward Christian soldiers rang out in the salt air. Both he and Roosevelt sensed the gravity of the moment, with so many of those young men soon to meet their fate in combat. When they returned to business, Churchill strongly urged Roosevelt to take a tougher line against Japanese aggression in the Pacific. He wanted a direct warning to Tokyo that further expansion would compel British and American countermeasures, even at the risk of war. But Roosevelt was more cautious. He did not want to provoke a confrontation until the US was fully prepared. So he proposed a milder diplomatic day march, keeping his options open. The two leaders also grappled with the question of aid to the beleaguered Soviet Union. And Churchill pressed Roosevelt to increase American naval activity in the Atlantic, arguing that greater intervention now would hasten victory. There were hints of future disagreements between British and American military strategists over the proper course of action against Germany, yet the most memorable outcome of the Agentia summit was the Atlantic Charter, a joint declaration of war aims and principles for the post-war world. Although neither leader came with a specific agenda for such a statement, Roosevelt feared that too much discussion of detailed post-war plans might rekindle old isolationist opposition. But Churchill saw an opportunity to link British and American policies more tightly for the future. After some heated negotiations over points of disagreement, they approved an eight-point charter that included self-determination of peoples, global economic cooperation, freedom of the seas, and disarmament of aggressors. Roosevelt resisted Churchill's pleas for an explicit endorsement of effective international organization after the war, not wanting to invoke Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations. But Churchill secured some vague language alluding to a future security framework. The Agentia summit lasted only a few days, but it was a pivotal moment in Anglo-American relations and the course of the war. Though no major strategic decisions emerged, it represented an important symbolic partnership between Roosevelt and Churchill and their nations, facing the great global struggle ahead. The two leaders came to know one another, took each other's measure, found common ground as well as areas of divergence. The personal chemistry and friendship they established would guide the Western Allies through for more hard years of conflict. And their Atlantic Charter would stand as a founding document of the post-war international order. The President had promised Churchill he would send a stern warning to Japan, but Hull and the State Department watered it down. When Nomura came to the White House, Roosevelt presented the weakened statement almost defensively. Nomura then proposed a meeting between Roosevelt and Conai Midway across the Pacific. Roosevelt was tempted by the dramatic summit idea despite his advisor's doubts. Conoy was eager too, hoping to bypass the militarists. But how on the Asia hands opposed the meeting without prior agreement on principles like respect for sovereignty? Ambassador Drew disagreed, this was the last chance for peace. 
With conflicting advice, Roosevelt tried to have it both ways, talking of the meeting while following Hong's demand for commitments first. In Tokyo, the military was also divided, but the oil crisis forced strategic decisions. On September 3rd, the chief set a deadline, go to war in early October absent diplomatic progress. Konoi agreed to let the military plan, hoping his summit gambit would work. Hirohito was shocked when briefed. He interrogated the chief sharply. Sugiyama admitted the war would take far longer than planned. The next day, Kido cleverly had Hirohito's questions asked for him at the Imperial Conference. But the United Front for War held. As his ministers finished their hawkish speeches, the Emperor rose and read his grandfather's poem questioning why winds of war rage despite oceans linking all lands. Stunned silence followed this sublime rebuke. Meanwhile in the Atlantic, the US destroyer Greer was tracking a U-boat, reporting its position to an aircraft. After two hours, the U-boat fired torpedoes, which missed. Roosevelt seized on the incident to publicly accuse Germany of piracy and shoot on site orders against Axis submarines. His speech put America closer to war in Europe as well. In Tokyo, word of the Greer incident erased hope for diplomacy. The deadline was moved up, the Emperor sanctioned war preparations. Konai still pleaded for his meeting, but Hull demanded full withdrawal from China, not just in Indochina. This was impossible, Konai protested to Drew. Efforts shifted to a new cabinet under General Tojo that would firmly control the military. Tojo demanded the government and military be of one mind. Against Navy objections, he set the war deadline even earlier in October. The Emperor received Tojo and asked many skeptical questions, how could he lead a war he himself did not believe was just? Tojo insisted war was unavoidable and vowed victory. Hiroya Koga replaced Nagano as Navy chief and assured Hirohito the Navy was ready. On October 16th, Hirohito sanctioned the war decision, though with misgivings. He pressed the chiefs to avoid a long war, but was told the initial campaigns should end quickly in Japan's favor. The Pearl Harbor attack and island invasions were set for December. Due to magic code breaking, Roosevelt knew the attack was coming, but desired a clear provocation to unite public opinion. So two great nations, each feeling forced into a corner, slid toward cataclysm. Had the Emperor spoken out sooner to check escalation or had the President softened his hard line on Japan's legitimate aspirations, tragedy might have been averted. Instead the winds of war prevailed. In the fall of 1941, the global war was intensifying on many fronts. German troops had made major advances against the Soviet Union, surrounding Leningrad and breaking through at Smolensk towards Moscow. In North Africa, Churchill was preparing a counterattack while pushing for more action in Asia. Tokyo wavered between peace and war under pressure from its military timetable. In China, Chiang Kai-shek's government seemed to be faltering. The Battle of the Atlantic was heating up as Washington and London tried to aid Britain. In Washington, Roosevelt faced demands from allies and enemies alike. Cabinet hawks gave conflicting advice. But Roosevelt remained steady and cautious, even as the strain took a toll on his health. He retreated more into his private world, spending weekends at Hyde Park and planning a fishing trip with Hopkins. Tension rose in Asia as Tokyo sent mixed signals. Conway seemed willing to negotiate on key issues if summit talks could be arranged. But Hull insisted on more concessions first, doubting Conway could control the military. Roosevelt, playing for time against Germany, did not push for talks even though they might aid his strategy. He was content to let Hull talk endlessly. The main obstacle was China. Despite promises, Japan insisted on keeping some troops there. China feared any deal seen as an appeasement of Japan. Through back channels, Chiang pressed Roosevelt against compromise, demanding more aid, which was slow in coming. Roosevelt backed Hong's hard line, afraid of undermining China's morale. In this tense atmosphere, misperceptions abounded despite substantial contact. The two sides were blind giants, seeing too little and too much. As the crisis peaked in October, Conley warned that his cabinet could fall without talks, but failed to move Roosevelt. When Connie resigned, Tojo took power to Washington's dismay. But reassurances followed, and Roosevelt waited to see what the new regime would do.
Soon after, U-boats attacked an Allied convoy, including the destroyer USS Kearney. Eleven Americans died in the first direct German attack on US forces. Isolationist objections were overcome and Congress narrowly voted to allow arming of merchant ships. In a dramatic Navy Day speech, Roosevelt condemned the shooting, vowed to defend America's ships and rally the nation to three our decks and take our battle stations. But initial impact was limited, symbolizing the long struggle ahead. So as 1941 drew to a close, great powers hurtled toward conflict despite fitful efforts at diplomacy. Pressures converged on Roosevelt to take a stand while playing for time against Hitler. In Asia, neither side fully grasped the other's pressures and perceptions. Disaster loomed through misunderstandings born of isolation and suspicion on all sides in a world drifting from crisis to crisis. It was early November 1941. Tension was rising between Japan's leaders. At a critical meeting, they debated whether to pursue diplomacy or immediately go to war. After 17 grueling hours, they agreed on a compromise, continue diplomacy, but vigorously prepare for war at the same time. A firm deadline was set, if diplomacy failed by December 1st, Japan would commence war regardless. In Washington, President Roosevelt was also pursuing last-ditch diplomacy while bracing for conflict. He urged withdrawal of Japanese troops from China, but Japan's envoys refused to budge. Both sides understood each other's interests clearly, yet those interests diverged too far. As the deadline approached, Roosevelt sketched out a six-month truce proposal. But strong objections came from all sides, the Chinese, Dutch, Australians, and even the British, who warned that China's collapse would be disastrous. The president's peace plan died when he learned of a Japanese naval move towards Indochina, seen as an act of bad faith. On November 26th, Secretary of State Hull issued a defiant 10-point proposal. I have washed my hands of it, he told Stinson. The time for talk was over. In Tokyo, the final order was given, the attack would commence on December 8th. In the first days of December, Roosevelt desperately sought to keep diplomacy alive, even asking the emperor directly to withdraw his troops. But the machinery of war was already in motion. The Japanese fleet sailed toward Hawaii, aircraft and their pilots having trained for months for the strike on Pearl Harbor. As hope for peace dimmed, Roosevelt asked Congress not to recess for more than three days. He considered reviving his truce proposal despite the risks. But on December 1st, he told more gentle bluntly, it is all in the maps of the gods. The president waited fatalistically as both sides hurtled towards war. So in the end, the leader's hopes for peace were in vain. Despite Roosevelt's tireless efforts, the diverging interests and the firmly entrenched positions on both sides left diplomacy barren. The military clockwork clicked inexorably onwards. And while the actors on the diplomatic stage still gesticulated, war now moved with a dreadful momentum of its own. Both sides share responsibility for the failure. Yet it was Japan which set that firm December deadline, giving diplomacy no room to breathe. And it was Japan which ultimately dealt the first blow when doom negotiations expired. Perhaps conflict was inevitable between two proud empires competing for supremacy. But the path to war was paved by countless small decisions, no less than by clashing ideologies or racial prejudices. And those small decisions might have broken the march to war had leaders seized fleeting chances for peace before it was too late. It was early on the morning of December 7, 1941 when over 180 Japanese fighter planes took off from aircraft carriers and headed towards Hawaii. The pilots saw the island bathed in morning sunlight, the ships lined up neatly along the harbor, unaware of what was about to unfold. At 7.30 a.m. the first wave attacked, diving down on the unsuspecting sailors having breakfast below. Explosions and flames erupted as torpedoes and bombs slammed into the ships, the Arizona exploding catastrophically when a bomb hit its magazine. The Oklahoma capsized after being struck by torpedoes. Within minutes, the harbor was in chaos under heavy attack as Japanese planes strafed sailors and bombed airfields up and down the coast. Back in Washington, the first panic messages came in, air raid Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Top officials were stunned, Sure, it must be a mistake. 
But President Roosevelt was grimly calm, saying this was just the kind of unexpected act the Japanese would carry out. When the full scale of the devastation sank in, Roosevelt was determined to respond strongly. He summoned the cabinet and congressional leaders, telling them this was the most serious meeting since Lincoln's cabinet convened at the start of the Civil War. He recounted the savage attack and pledged absolute victory, no matter how long it took. The next day, Roosevelt appeared before Congress, vowing that the date of December 7th, a date which will live in infamy, would be remembered for Japan's act of treachery. He asserted that hostilities existed and that America would not only defend itself, but make sure such an attack never endangered them again. His speech received thunderous applause. In London, Churchill was overjoyed at the news, feeling England was saved at last. The war would be long, but America was now fully in the fight. After years standing alone, British determination had finally brought its greatest ally into the war. The story focuses on those first tense days, the shock and chaos of the attack, Roosevelt's cool resolve to retaliate, Churchill's elation that America would join the war. It highlights the devastation at Pearl Harbor and national outrage that would drive America's entry into World War II.